right, I love this room for an event like this. My name is Indy Burke, and I'm the Dean of the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies, and I want to welcome you all here for the John F. Carey Initiatives Yale Climate Conference, and this is session one on the future of energy. We're incredibly honored to be able to host this first session and super proud to uh, support your, the Carey Initiative at Yale. As we all know, Secretary Kerry's been an incredible leader in this arena, and we're seeing his continuing leadership right now through his Yale initiative. I have the opportunity, since we're hosting, to tell you a little bit about our school. And so I'm going to take that opportunity right now and tell you about how unique we are and how it relates to what we're doing with this conference. Our school has a 118-year-old history of providing knowledge and leadership for a sustainable future. We provide this knowledge and leadership through the remarkable scholarship and applied impact of our faculty and through our professional masters and doctoral programs. Our faculty lead in interdisciplinary scholarship on all aspects of environmental sustainability. Climate change science, climate change policy and economics, climate change communications, energy policy and economics, forestry urban science, water science and management, environmental health and environmental justice, biological diversity and ecosystem management, human dimensions of natural resources, and of course, much more. We conduct cutting edge scholarship, but beyond that, we're really unique because we're not in an ivory tower. We do scholarship for impact. We bring science to society. Our current faculty have held positions that allow them to bring their scholarship directly to policy and impact in leadership positions at the state, national, and international level. For instance, Dan Esty in his role of commissioner of the Connecticut Department of Energy and Environmental Protection started the Connecticut Green Bank, which just won a National Innovation Award. Matt Kotchin, who used international finance to promote clean energy and climate adaptation from his position as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Energy and Environment at the Treasury Department. Paul Anastas, who reinvigorated EPA science to impact sustainability as Assistant Administrator for Research and Development. Ken Gillingham, who provided analytical support for domestic energy and climate policy as Senior Economist with the White House Council of Economic Advisor. And we currently have Dan Utek, who's a visiting professor here who coordinated climate initiatives in the Obama administration. It's a remarkable faculty. You will not find another like it with this kind of impact anywhere else in the world. We've also fledged nearly 5,000 alumni who lead all over the world in their scholarship and their impact. And they're incredibly well connected with one another. And I'll just give one example. One of our most famous and first alumni, Aldo Leopold, is part of Secretary Kerry's family. Through his wife, Teresa Hines, who received our school's highest award herself, the Aldo Leopold Award, for her contributions for environmental awareness. We're also proud, proud to claim their son, Andre Hines, as an FES alumnus from 1999. In terms of training leaders, you can't swing a stick in Washington, D.C. or in Geneva without hitting one or more of our alumni who are bringing environmental solutions to our nation and our world. We've recently com completed a strategic planning exercise to crystallize our existing strengths and build upon, and I'm just going to mention three. One is we're building a new climate change initiative, which will uh, expand upon our strengths and bring in other partners from across campus for climate solutions. A second is a major new program in environmental communications that will build on the work of our own Yale program in climate change communications to expand to a diversity of environmental challenges. And third, we're creating a new program we call the Environmental Dialogue to support us in convening many conversations about the critical environmental challenges of our day. We launched that yesterday through a conversation with Laurent Fabius through the process of, about the process of reaching the Paris Accord. So let's get started. Let me thank uh, Frank Lowenstein for his efforts for bringing together the Jackson Institute and many entities across campus. Uh, for someone who is not regularly part of a university, you have to know that bringing together the different parts of a university is quite a chore. So thank you for helping <laughs> to carry this off. Uh, uh, we have with us here today a great group of panelists, and the bios are online, so I'm just going to mention 
titles for the most part. Uh, to start off, we have Ernie Moniz, former U.S. Secretary of Energy, who's been a pioneer in his field for three de decades. We have Jonathan Pershing, former U.S. State Department Special Envoy for Climate Change, who's traveled all over the world on these issues. We have Mr. Tony Early, former CEO and current Executive Chair of PG&E, which has been a leading company on sustainable energy issues. We have Mr. Mark Bolin, CEO and founder of 2C Energy, who's been pioneering low-carbon energy solutions in the industry, and Heather Zeichel, who is the former Deputy Assistant to President Obama for Energy and Climate Change. And now let's turn to Secretary Kerry, who will kick off the conference, and let's thank him for his incredible leadership for the environment. <laughs> Andy, thank you very, very much. Thank you for inviting us to be here and sharing this incredible, beautiful building with us. I understand the first platinum building at Yale in New Haven. Spectacular at Yale. So we're, we're very happy to be here. And uh, I want to thank all the members of the Yale community for the wonderful welcome they have given to me personally as I as a transition into a new stage of engagement. Uh, I'm particularly grateful to President Peter Salovey and to Dean Jim uh, Levinson of the uh, Jackson Institute, where our initiative is housed as we work with the law school, the business school, forestry school, of divinity, uh, and law school. And uh, of course, the Yale Board of Trustees have been supportive in this, and the staff of this initiative has been really just terrific. Uh, Sona Lin is, Sona, I don't know where she is here, but she's the mainstay of this thing. And uh, Frank Lowenstein, Kate Harris, thank you all for helping to bring people together here. Uh, it is a privilege for me to welcome this distinguished panel to begin uh, this initiative. We are intending over the next two days to build a record. Uh, we're not here uh, to debate the science. We're here to lay out an agenda and to measure where we are and measure where we have to go and how we're going to get there. And each of the people here are people I've gotten to know as I've worked on this challenge uh, since the 1980s. Uh, and I will say that uh, uh, having them here is a privilege. There is a huge amount of experience, way beyond uh, our ability in the intros uh, to document the fullness of the lives of each of the people in this panel. But each of them has made a remarkable difference and continues to make a difference. And that's why they're here. Uh, we have a group of fellows, about 14 or so strong, who will be summarizing uh, all of the panels here. And we'll be issuing a report out of these two days, which will include, as you know, Secretary Jim Baker, Secretary Hank Paulson, uh, Jeff Immel, other leaders from industry, uh, as well as activists, uh, Leonardo DiCaprio, uh, Governor Jerry Brown, Governor Inslee. So we have a power-packed uh, 48 hours in which I believe the agenda will become <coughs> even more clear. Uh, I want to thank the students. There are a lot of students who can't fit into the rooms who want to take part. Uh, we are actually at each event, I think, at capacity, uh, including Woolsey Hall. Uh, and I think there will be great interest in, in, in the presentations that will be made. But it's you, the students, that this is really all about. I mean, this is the key. Uh, because, sadly, Climate change is a challenge that you're going to inherit one way or the other. And hopefully working together, we can lay out the tools that everyone needs in order to mitigate where mitigation is necessary and build a more sustainable planet. And that is a huge part of what this conference is about. I have to say it, we are here partly to fill a void. We're here because too many politicians who have the responsibility to defend our nation and the planet 
are hardly doing so by ignoring on the national level the devastating impact of climate change. Now, Election Day, November 8, 2016, I couldn't have been further away from domestic politics. And looking back now, uh, maybe that was a wise decision. Uh, and I'm not saying that just for the partisan reason that you might suspect. This is not a partisan conference. I spent Election Day headed to Antarctica by way of New Zealand. And yes, uh, truth requires me to say that when I learned the results, we thought of staying in McMurdo Sound. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but we obviously didn't. And we came back because we know we have to continue to work towards the critical goal that we face. Uh, but I was there at ground zero for climate change. I went there because when I visited Svalbard and the Arctic with my friend Borge Brenda, the foreign minister of Norway, the scientist there said to me, you know, Mr. Secretary, this is interesting and we're going to show you a lot, but you're really not going to learn the full measure of this challenge unless you go to Antarctica. So I went back, uh, shared with President Obama my intention as well as desire to go down there. He immediately said, God, I want to go with you. <laughs> Uh, and would have, I think, loved to have done so had logistics and timing allowed him to. But when I was in McMurdo Sound sitting with this vast array of scientists of all these countries uh, that are assembled there doing research every single day, they pulled out chart after chart and described the latest deeply alarming evidence of what is happening to our planet. I flew by helicopter over the West Antarctic ice sheet. I walked out onto the Ross Sea ice shelf, and I talked with researchers who had no reason to and didn't mince words. A scientist from New Zealand named Gavin Dunbar described what they're seeing there as a canary in a coal mine, the unmistakable canary in a coal mine, he said. And he warned that some thresholds if we cross them, cannot be reversed. We talked about a lot during that visit, but one thing we didn't mention once was politics. And that's because despite what you hear from talking heads and political pundits, there is nothing partisan about this challenge, about this threat. It's amazing when I think about it. A nuclear weapon overtly brandished in the hands of the wrong person in the wrong country, receives significant focus and crisis management, and rightly so. But a silent killer that compounds its destructive power daily and threatens the lives of literally billions of people with increasing destructive force is ignored and even mocked. The fact is that uh, climate change is proving itself routinely as a force of mass destruction. And given the science, which we are seeing firsthand every single day with fearsome reality, citizens deserve a response from those who are responsible for guiding the future. They deserve a response exhibiting the urgency which this challenge deserves. Now, each day, many of the predictions of scientists made 10, 15, 20 years ago come true with alarming cost and accuracy. Now, I can't prove, nobody can prove, nobody up here has the ability to prove that any one single weather event is the direct cause of climate change. But scientists do tell us that we can expect more of these significant weather events. And they predicted that a long time ago. And they can tell us we will have them with greater frequency. And they can tell us, as they have predicted previously, that the impacts will grow worse and worse. Now, one thing to emphasize as we think about this in these next 48 hours and well beyond, I hope, extreme weather events do not come with a D or an R after the names Harvey or Irma. 
There's nothing partisan about wildfires that are burning in the West, which have already charred an area larger than the state of Maryland, or 100-year droughts that occur with greater frequency now that hurt farmers and ranches. There is nothing political about the havoc that ever more powerful storms wreaked in places like Texas, Louisiana, the Caribbean, Florida. And everyone tells us that because of the heating of the ocean, because of the increased levels of moisture, we will have and are having more rain. There will be greater intensity to the wind. And so there's nothing partisan about any of the evidence that is piling up. Rivers and streams that don't freeze over, ice that is melting so that the Arctic will be open in the summer within the next 20 years or so, the levels of drought in various parts of the world, the moving of crops, the inability of people to grow where they once grew things, the rise of sea level, a city of Miami where the mayor is currently elevating roads because on a sunny day they have to pump water out of those roads, Boston where the sea wall sees water come over it on a sunny day, high tide. So it was the understanding of some almost 200 nations that came together in Paris that these things are happening now and that they are the profound harbinger of worse things to come unless we take action. That is the understanding that in 2015 led nearly 200 nations to agree in Paris that we would do all in our power with each nation deciding for itself what it could do. No burden imposed on any nation, contrary to what the president said when announcing withdrawal from Paris. No burden placed on any nation beyond what it defined for itself. And each nation according to its own national circumstances, hoping to cap the rise in temperatures to no more than two degrees Celsius, and if possible, the great aspirational goal of one and a half degrees centigrade. I want to thank Sue Biniaz, who is here. Sue has worked a lifetime on this. She teaches at the Yale Law School, and she was just a brilliant and critical uh, negotiator and understood the legalities of every move we were making like nobody. And Sue, we are very grateful to you for your help and leadership on that. So, my friends, it is science. I'm not gonna do it, but go back and reread the definition of science. Uh, based on facts, uh, and as John Adams said, facts are stubborn things. But we, now understand that the facts implore us to dramatically accelerate our efforts if we're going to achieve our goal. So we have a long way to go. That's the bad news. We are way behind where we need to be, even with Paris. And that truth has to be talked about more and more. But the good news, and there's plenty of it, believe it or not, the good news is that we are racing ahead in technology. The good news is that we already have the means to meet this challenge right now. This is not a situation where we're waiting for some pie-in-the-sky solution to be found by somebody at some point in the future. We have the solutions now. The solution to climate change challenge is energy policy. And winning this battle is not a question of waiting for the future. It is a question of creating the political will to do what we already know how to do. And it's a function of leadership, and part of this conference is dedicated to show the ways in which, with leadership, the private sector and many in the public sector are already moving in exactly the right direction. The question is not whether we can get there. The question is whether we will get there fast enough. So when we gaveled in the Paris Agreement, and you had Laura Fabius here yesterday, we knew that the text in and of itself would not meet the two-degree goal. I said that immediately after the gavel came down, when I was recognized to speak. Our objective was to send a message to the marketplace that countries were committed to try. And our assumption was that if that message was strong enough, then it would change the flow and the amount of capital investment in 
alternative renewable sustainable energy, and I'm proud to say, pleased to say, that is exactly what happened. Last year, for the first time in history, more money was invested by twofold in renewable energy than in the development of fossil fuels. Wind and solar are now cheaper than coal. And if you honestly account for coal, and, and I'm engaged in discussions with the government of Vietnam right now about this, because they've been planning to build 19 additional to 50 additional coal-fired power plants. That's suicidal. And the truth is that if you accurately account for the coal sludge, for the air pollution, for the black lung, for the destruction of storms, for other health impacts, for the devastating impact of CO2 on, on coral reef, on the ocean, on crustaceans, I mean, run the list. You add all those costs up, and there is no comparison between the cost of coal and the cost of renewables. The fact is that with proper technology transfer, and this is something we'll talk about, as well as funding, no one needs to build a coal-fired power plant anywhere in the world. So more and more people in both the private and the public sectors are now better understanding the cost and the opportunities. And across the country, local leaders and business executives answered President Trump's withdrawal from the Paris Agreement with their own pledges to meet the commitments of Paris or even exceed them. So this conference is not about what the White House is or isn't doing on climate change. It's about what everyone else is doing and can do. In the energy sector, the financial sector, state and local government, even ordinary citizens. And those are the issues that we're focusing on here at Yale. Already there is a massive acceleration in the application of clean energy choices. And they're building a new paradigm, a virtuous cycle of cleaner energy choices that are creating a more sustainable economy. And leaders on both sides of the aisle actually do know what we need to do. We need to drive investments in clean energy and supporting technologies. We need to continue the great tradition of American innovation. I'm sure Ernie will talk some about that and Tony. We need to recognize that while there are some 55,000 or so coal miners who depend on coal in the United States for work. The fact is that the fastest growing job in the United States of America is wind energy technician. And there are tens of millions of jobs to be created in the building of the new infrastructure of the new energy <laughs> paradigm for the world. So we need to support our cities and states as they move to do this. And I believe that uh, over the course of the next uh, 48 hours, we're going to set out goals that are achievable. We're going to measure the ways we can get there. And hopefully Yale will today, with the help of visiting uh, folks from various uh, sectors of our economy, uh, we will lay out a way in which we can begin a conversation about the energy future of our nation that the American people want and deserve. So with that, let me, you, you, you've had the introductions. I just want to say that John Pershing and I traveled many places together. He was instrumental working with us on the uh, entire uh, array of these issues with the major emitter nations, 20 nations that are fundamentally responsible for the worst of what we're feeling the effects of today in the world. And Jonathan's as expert as they come on that. Ernie Moniz. It would take me all morning to list the many things he does. He's taken on from Sam Nunn the position of the threat reduction program, uh, an extraordinary contribution as nuclear physicist. He understands nuclear and power and energies, work with government, private sector, at MIT, and in various other incarnations. And, and uh, he was a great partner uh, in, in, in our efforts uh, to uh, conclude the Iran nuclear agreement. Uh, and his knowledge uh, proved just absolutely essential in our ability to be able to do that, and I'm grateful to him for that. And Tony Earle, I worked with him when we were crafting a climate change piece of legislation in the Senate, which we got up to 55 votes for after the House had passed something. People forget how close we came, but then a major coal company started to advertise and terrify some of my colleagues, and, and then the BP blowout took place in the Gulf, and it just stopped dead in its tracks, unfortunately. But we had BP, Chevron, you know, ExxonMobil, 
all at the table, along with nuclear industry, the environment industry, the faith-based industry, we came close. And it proved to me that with leadership, we do have the capacity to be able to move this forward. Uh, Heather Zeichel worked with me in the Senate, worked for President Obama in many different roles, but finally, as you heard, as advisor. Um, and uh, Mark is uh, the founder, Mark Rolling is the founder of a new uh, energy enterprise, spent a lot of his life in energy and gas, uh, particularly expert on frac frac fracturing and on uh, natural gas, but also finding now, he's founder of a company, uh, 2C Energy, which is uh, looking for new solutions and new ways to try to move forward. So I've talked long enough. I want to get this panel going. We can go a little bit beyond our time because of the introductory uh, needs of this first session today. Uh, and uh, I'm going to tur turn, turn to Ernie. Each of the panelists I would ask to first uh, just make some broad comments based, uh, if you will, play off anything that I said, except don't contradict me. And, uh, uh, I might come close, John, but anyway. <laughs> and, uh, and let's uh, uh, dig in here as much as we can. We want to have a conversation, not a series of monologue speeches. We really want to have, feel free, each of you, to take up where someone else was without my intercession. But let's try to have a solid uh, an examination of the energy options and the energy possibilities of the future. So, Ernie. Great. Well, thank you, John. Um, uh, at my first broad statement is I can't say uh, how much in the last four years John and I were uh, together, uh, as he said, from Paris to uh, Iran. And uh, I, we actually had fun and, and, got, and got a lot done. I would have said we Negotiating sold. can include some bottles of wine and That's good right. food. Right. <laughs> Uh, I, uh, I would have said we were shoulder to shoulder, except there's about a one foot difference, and so it didn't, didn't, quite, uh, didn't quite work out that way. But uh, in terms of history as well, I can't resist saying uh, with this panel that uh, in 2004, uh, I was the co-chairman of uh, scientists and engineers for Kerry. And our liaison was none other than Heather Zeichel. <laughs> so we did go back a ways, actually, in this, uh, in this panel. We do. Um, now, going to Paris, let me just say that uh, in, in Paris, uh, of course, uh, the Paris Accord uh, uh, is uh, rightfully uh, uh, focused on. John, obviously, uh, was an enormous role uh, there. But also at Paris, a, another, uh, uh, I think, major step was taken, one in which my colleagues in the Department of Energy played a major role, something called Mission Innovation. Mission Innovation was an agreement by 20 countries at the time uh, to double uh, uh, energy, clean energy innovation uh, R&D investments over a five-year ramp-up uh, period. Uh, and uh, the announcement was accompanied by Bill Gates on stage to note that he was representing 28 international investors who were prepared to put in serious capital with serious patience to capture the fruits of that innovation. So it was a dual, uh, in some sense there were dual announcements. The end of the Paris meeting the, the agreement to move forward, meet ambitious targets in the 2030 time frame typically, uh, but also uh, focusing in on the technology solutions that would be, that would be required to meet those and, and future, uh, future targets. Unfortunately, uh, and John alluded at least uh, indirectly to uh, the current administration uh, announcing at least its intent to uh, withdraw from the accord, but I also want to note the administration, regrettably, has also uh, not supported the second pillar, the innovation pillar, uh, in the sense that their budget uh, submission to the Congress uh, uh, put the two in the denominator rather than the numerator. Uh, and, uh, and this would just kind of unilaterally uh, really at least disarm uh, an, an important part of this country's uh, innovation agenda. The, uh, that's significant for a bunch of reasons, of course, meeting our climate targets. But I also note that despite the announcement on the accord, I've said many times, I firmly believe there is no going back. There's no status quo ante after the Paris Accord. We are heading to a low carbon future. Uh, it may be a bit rockier uh, without federal leadership uh, over the next several years. We'll see how that, how that goes. But that's where we are going. That's where the world is going, and that means a multi-trillion dollar global clean energy marketplace. Uh, 
it would be putting aside <laughs> the overarching climate objectives, it is not a very good move to, uh, to also undercut our competitive position uh, in that clean energy marketplace. I do want to just make a comment uh, on the, uh, the hurricanes that John described, uh, just to note that the, the hurricanes, I won't go into the science, uh, which John, the scientist, has covered uh, uh, quite adequately, uh, uh, seriously, uh, but to note that those showed the importance of both mitigation and adaptation. The reality is we are and we will have to keep adapting as well. In fact, Florida Power and Light, which has gotten a lot of press uh, in these last uh, weeks, I would just note, to give you the idea of the costs of adaptation, that one utility is al has already invested the better part of $4 billion hardening, Tony knows this very well, you know, hardening poles, uh, building uh, sea, uh, uh, protection against flooding of substations and the like. Extremely expensive. But if we think in terms of the human toll that John also referred to, actually one of my former colleagues, an economist, Michael Greenstone, did an exquisite analysis of the impacts of warming, uh, especially the fact that warming really manifests itself in, in many more very hot days. He did a study in which uh, he found that very hot days uh, led to substantial uh, morbidity, mortality uh, impacts in India and not in the United States. It was very simple. It's adaptation. It's called air conditioning. Regrettably, however, we saw in the tragic nursing home event in Florida what happens when you can't adapt through the, through the air conditioning, through the lack of electricity and air conditioning. So this is really, as John says, very, very, obviously very, very serious business. Uh, and we need to get on with this uh, business of uh, developing the technologies, deploying the technologies to avoid, uh, uh, to avoid the worst impacts of climate change, to minimize our adaptation costs through effective, effective mitigation. Now, having said that, let me just uh, tee up some questions and say that in that energy transformation, we, we're going to need many, many uh, building blocks. Certainly energy efficiency across the board, transportation, buildings, uh, industry, uh, electricity decarbonization, uh, renewables, nuclear, carbon capture, sequestration. I want to emphasize is that those two building blocks, the demand side and electricity decarbonization, are essentials. There, I have never seen any credible approach to addressing climate uh, that uh, does not have those two as major, major uh, components. But then it's more. Uh, of course, if we decarbonize electricity, then we have to get on with electrification as much as we can of other sectors. But it will not solve the problems completely for those sectors, but it must be important solutions, transportation, buildings, heat, heating, uh, and, and, uh, and, and the like. Uh, we'll need to go to low carbon fuels. Uh, our advanced biofuels are not at the stage, frankly, uh, where they can uh, both uh, may, uh, where they can both uh, be large-scale replacements uh, and be major carbon emission life cycle savers. So we need we need more progress uh, there, uh, and maybe hydrogen is going to play an important role as a second energy carrier to to displace uh, fuels. Another area I'd like to mention and partly it's energy and partly it's outside of energy, but we really have to get serious in addressing the so-called minor greenhouse gases. Uh, uh, methane is an example, but also another very important uh, uh, diplomatic uh, step forward uh, was the Kigali Agreement extending the Montreal Protocol for hydrofluorocarbons. This alone could account for half, maybe a degree centigrade of warming, half yeah, I, I would go more with half, but others have said one. Uh, so uh, so I, I would say a half degree centigrade or so of warming there uh, uh, in, uh, in what would be a very, very important area. But finally, and this is where I'm going to go a little bit, John, outside your envelope. I would agree that we, especially as we look at ongoing innovation and cost reduction, that, uh, that I can see the pathway 
certainly with our existing suite of technologies, uh, to address the kinds of targets that were put forward at Paris. But Paris, as important as it was, has to be viewed as a first step towards very deep decarbonization, certainly of the industrialized societies uh, on the mid-century time frame, which is not very far away uh, for that. Uh, that deep decarbonization, I believe, is going to require uh, deep innovation, uh, including very large-scale carbon management, both engineered carbon management solutions and biologically based carbon solution, terrestrial, uh, terrestrial carbon uh, sequestration, if you, uh, if, if you like. Uh, new ways of utilizing CO2 uh, that, that are durable uh, and can take the gigaton scales of, of CO2 out. So I think that the innovation, uh, the innovation task is far from, far from complete, and that's one reason why uh, we're going to have to see continued uh, federal, federal leadership. Let me just end by only teeing up a, a, couple, of, a couple of things, because uh, I don't have time to discuss them. But one is that innovation in technology uh, is certainly central, but with that innovation in technology is going to come, and maybe Tony will talk about this, innovation in business models. Certainly in the electricity sector, for, for sure, <coughs> as we see uh, the complete integration or the more complete integration of information technology, for example, a lot of the action going be behind the meter uh, in a business not seeing increase in its uh, product sales, that is uh, electricity uh, uh, use being flat, maybe even declining, this is going to call for big business model changes integrated with policy and regulatory changes uh, uh, over, over time. I'll be happy to get back into that. The last point I'll make is another different kind of innovation that I think we need is a bottom-up innovation, regionally focused, uh, looking and starting from the issues of workers and communities, mapping out a future of development at the local and regional level that is in line with a deeply decarbonized future. If we don't have all of our communities and all of our regions thinking that they can be part of this future, we will continue to have political headwinds. We need, to we need to turn those around to tailwinds. Thank you. Ernie, that's great. There are a couple things I want to come back to. So let's see if they get covered perhaps by some of the others. Tony, let me turn to you if I can and sure. pick up there um, since he referenced your. I want to thank the secretary for inviting me not only to be here, but he actually made me a rock star in my house. He happened to call me to invite me when I was on vacation with my grandkids. and. Uh, I think one of my daughters-in-law answered the phone and said, uh, Secretary Kerry's office is on the phone. And my 12-year-old granddaughter said, I thought your secretary's name was B. <laughs> <laughs> and I had to explain to her who Secretary Kerry was. So that made me a rock star in, in my house. I, I, take, I take a lot of guff at home about that. <laughs> my, so, my grandkids uh, say, will you take notes, please? <laughs> I, I have to say that my, my assistant at MIT, when I went to the administration, gave me a book how to be a secretary. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just want to cover a couple of things, and, and I want to review some of my experiences in almost 40 years in the industry, um, because I think they'll, they'll highlight not only my personal journey, but I think professionally where the industry has come. I've actually had the privilege of running three different uh, utilities in the U.S., Long Island Lighting Company in New York, DT Energy in Michigan, and now PG&E in San Francisco. Um, each one of them had a different mix. In fact, my whole career spans a whole range of ups and downs in, in our industry. Loco was basically an oil-fired utility, so every time there was a hiccup in the Midwest, electric prices skyrocketed. Um, I tried to stabilize those rates by investing in a nuclear plant on the north shore of Long Island. Unfortunately, after Three Mile Island, it became wildly unpopular and wildly expensive. Uh, and we actually, the way we ended up stabilizing rates was a heavy investment in energy efficiency. And that was one of my first ahas. That's an interesting approach. Uh, moved to DTE Energy uh, in Detroit. It was a coal-fired uh, utility. Very stable rates, very low cost. But we were continuing to invest in uh, pollution controls on our plants that became very expensive. And we were one of the first utilities that started the transformation 
certainly in the Midwest, from a coal-fired electric economy to a natural gas-fired. We were lucky enough to invest in shale gas properties uh, in the 1990s uh, and were able to take advantage of that major shift uh, in the industry. And we also started uh, some investment in wind. And again, while it was uneconomic at the time, we saw that was a potential. And then six years ago, uh, moved to PG&E in California. And of course, California has had 30 plus years of trying to get the model right. Uh, they did have a false start in the 90s where the legislature tried to micromanage a very complex electric system. It failed miserably uh, and the, precipitated the energy crisis in California drove one utility into bankruptcy, another one on the verge of bankruptcy, but eventually got a good mix of programs and policies that work. And from the experience of those three companies, let me just give you three takeaways that, that I have that I think are, are useful. One is that you can dramatically reduce carbon emissions and have a healthy economy at the same time. And California is example number one. And it's a combination of programs. So energy efficiency is vital in any of these approaches. Um, California, over the past 30 years, has basically had flat per capita usage of electricity because of their investment in energy efficiency, whereas the rest of the country has about a 40% uh, increase. Um, in California, the utilities are moving towards greenhouse gas free, PG&E, my company. 70% of our electricity is greenhouse gas free with a mix of solar, wind, nuclear, hydro, bio biomass. And the other 30% is uh, natural gas, uh, which certainly is much, we have no coal uh, on, on our system. Uh, we've got a successful cap and trade program, uh, which was set to expire in 2020. And just earlier this year, the governor's office, uh, the utilities and the major environmentally friendly companies, so the Apples, the Googles, and others of the world, united to get a 10-year extension on, on cap and trade, which means I think it's permanent because by then it'll be, be so ingrained. Uh, and yet the economy is as, is as strong as it's ever been in California. I mean, we are the, if we were a country, we'd be the sixth largest economy in the world. Um, so people who say you can have one or the other, it's absolutely wrong. You can have both. Second takeaway is that you don't necessarily need a comprehensive national energy policy to make very significant gains. It would help if you had that. Uh, and when the secretary was senator, as he said, we worked together and came close. Um, but the reality is if large energy companies, large environmentally friendly companies, uh, and customers demand clean energy in their states or regions, you can make meaningful progress. And again, California being the example, deploying the US leading energy efficiency programs by a combination of mandates and policy changes. Um, the support for grid modernization, because as Ernie said, many of the cool new technologies require a lot of changes in the grid. Think of what happened in the internet. The internet used to be pretty simple. You could send messages back and forth. Now you can do anything you want on the internet. Behind that is billions of dollars of technology investment. Well, California regulators and large customers have supported our investment in the grid to facilitate. Uh, things like promoting customer preferences. So whether it's now within 72 hours of calling us, if you've had a rooftop solar unit uh, installed on your house, we'll get you hooked up. We have 300,000 rooftop solar units uh, on our system. That's about 25% of every solar unit in the U.S. We charge 20% of all electric vehicles because the state has put in place rates that encourage charging. It's about a dollar a gallon equivalent uh, to charge your electric vehicle. So states and regions can put together these combination of policies that will drive uh, the system forward. The final uh, takeaway from all of this work, though, is Policy development has to look at the big picture, and ultimately, it's got to be sustainable. If new technologies are not economic in the long run, they are not going to be sustainable, uh, and they will collapse in on themselves. And so we always have to look at it through, through that lens. I mean, one of the lenses that's playing out now is net energy metering. Uh, it's great. It was originally created to encourage rooftop solar units. 
um, and you can net out your electricity. So if you size your rooftop solar unit to be exactly equal to your usage, you pay your local utility nothing, except you are the heaviest user of the grid in that state because you're putting electricity out in. You have to install voltage regulation to manage that part of the grid. And so you need to transform your rate structure because rate structures today, Thomas Edison would recognize them. You pay, you get all the costs, you average them together, and you charge a customer of cents per kilowatt hour. Um, it's kind of like the telephone system you used to pay for minute calling on the phone. Now it's for the, the value of what you use. So it's not the number of minutes your phone is hooked up to the grid, it's how much data is being uh, traded. What's the speed of da data transfer? And so uh, we need to make sure that our regulatory systems keep up with the technology changes. Tony, thank you. Um, Heather, you spent a lot of time in government trying to fashion the policies that will shape the private sector response and move fast enough. So share with us a little bit so your sense of where we are, and, and, and let me obviously, there are difficulties because the administration is withdrawn. But leaving that aside, what do you think uh, government ought to be doing now, can be doing, and is it critical to this, or is the private sector capable of simply chasing the money in the market and doing this by itself? Uh, well, like everybody else, I just want to say I'm obviously very grateful for your leadership on these issues, but I also want to, you know, add a little personal note here. Um, it was in 2002 when I interviewed uh, for the job of Senator Kerry's legislative aide, um, and I, uh, you know, like many people that interview, wasn't quite sure I would have, was going to get the job, but I was crossing my fingers because I looked up to the secretary so much and the work that he'd done in the Senate. Um, and I have to say the fact that you took a leap of faith in a girl from Northeastern Iowa who'd only been to Boston once um, and let me uh, come Iowa with was you. a magic word. Plan <laughs> <laughs> <Atlanta> ahead. <laughs> but I, you know, it was really my time working with you that, you know, you taught me how to negotiate a deal. You taught me how to remain very optimistic in the face of a lot of ugliness. And that ultimately catapulted me to the White House where I was advising President Obama on these issues. So I wanted to say I'm grateful for you for many reasons, but certainly that's at the top of my list. Um, second, you know, as, as I sort of think about where the opportunities are, I think so, to many of the points that Tony made, it's easy to look at this landscape today and say, you know, it, you know, with President Trump in office, making decisions on a daily basis to roll back environmental health protections, to, you know, ditch the Paris Accords, et cetera, it's, it can be a pretty depressing daily regime to read the newspaper. But I also think what's really interesting is the transition and the role that the private sector has been playing. Not only have they changed what they're doing, but they've changed the way they're doing it. I mean, just this morning in reading the paper, Secretary Moniz mentioned the Kigali Accords, right? So HFC is this groundbreaking accord that um, really will have a lasting and meaningful impact on our GHG footprint. The interesting thing that is not, you know, you don't hear Pruitt from EPA talking about this, but you actually have Honeywell air conditioning companies and chemical manufacturers who've been trying to figure out how they're going to comply with the Montreal Protocol for 30 years, and they are in the White House, and they are saying, do not walk away from this, do not mess this up, because for us, it's business certainty and predictability, and that's more important than anything else. And, you know, I think that message is really important for, for policymakers to hear, because, I mean, I, I think back to some of the days when we were working on whether it was the first ever mercury standard or the clean power plan, um, you know, I heard from Tony about the fact that, you know, we, they recognized in the utility sector that climate policy was inevitable and they'd rather know the rules of the road today because they're making decisions on 20, 30, and 40 year time horizons. They're not just able to switch on a dime. Um, so that message of, of business certainty and predictability is one that we know is not only true, but I think it's also something that can be really impactful with this Trump administration. 
Um, you know, another, another example of business certainty and predictability was a work that I did with Mark Bowling um, because, you know, similarly, the oil and gas industry was looking at sort of the reaction from fractivists saying, look, we don't want more oil and gas production in our backyard. We're worried about our air quality. We're worried about our water quality. Um, but, you know, Mark stepped out and said, look, let's find ways that we can work together. We, you know, he forged a partnership with EDF working with uh, the Environmental Protection Agency, we tried to fill some data gaps. So I think it, my takeaway in all this is that it's very easy to read the top line messages and get very depressed about the state of the policy making in Washington. But I am very encouraged about the continuing and important role that the private sector can play. And I do think that there are opportunities behind the scenes working with industry to convince the Trump administration, as they whiz, we're, we're doing with uh, HFC and the Kigali Accords, that there are going to be some opportunities for us to keep wins on the board, and we have to keep our eye on that prize. Um, you know, I also think what, what has been interesting, um, you know, in, in sort of reactions to the Paris Accord, it was in less than 100 hours after the decision was made, you saw dozens upon dozens of cities, uh, CEOs, universities, mayors, stepping up and saying, we're still in. And so there is huge opportunity outside the Beltway to pull together, either on a regional basis, to work together with the private and public sector, to help you know, lift up the work that mayors are trying to do to make their communities greener, and more sustainable. So, you know, I guess in a world where it's hard to find a silver lining, I get my message would be, you know, there there are certainly places that we can look because as we've all, as I think all of us are going to say today, you know, a low, low carbon economy is the way of the future. And it's, you know, it's gonna be, nobody said it was gonna be perfect from the beginning. It's gonna be a little bit bumpy or now it's gonna be even a little more bumpy, but, you know, that's where, that's where the world is heading and we just need to get on board. Thank you, Heather. Thank you for your nice comments, too. So, Mark, you uh, have been uh, on the straight, old-fashioned oil and gas side of this, and now you've moved to this innovative, uh, meet the challenge, founding effort of a new company. So, perhaps you could as you describe, uh, as you sort of do your opening comments, you might also just sort of say what motivated, what do you see as the greatest promise within where, where you're looking at now? Sure, I'd, I'd be happy to, and, <clears throat> and I'd also like to thank you for inviting me here um, and convening this conference at this time. It's, it's a great time to do it, um, and it's very important. I read your column this morning in the Boston Globe, and I think there's every <coughs> reason to be optimistic uh, that climate change can and will be a bipartisan issue again. Uh, it just, it has to be. Failure is not an option. Uh, from where I sit, um, as being an uh, energy executive that has spent more than 30 years in Houston, um, I think that if we don't seize this opportunity to lead the world to the future of energy, then it will be like our future uh, will be described by those five words that NASA never wants to hear. Houston, we have a problem. <laughs> and, and you know, I, I admit I get funny looks uh, sometimes back at home uh, when people see how committed I am uh, on the climate change issue. Uh, but what they don't understand is that uh, I'm committed on climate change not despite being in the energy business, but because I'm in the energy business. Uh, on this issue, everything that I've learned tells me that the right thing to do is also the smart thing to do. Everything I've learned tells me that the enormous changes that are going on in the ener energy industry right now will lead to enormous opportunities if we get smarter faster. And so how do we do that? How do we get smarter faster? Well, we're gonna talk a lot about that in the next two days, I think, but from my perspective, the business perspective, let me tell you what I think that is. And, and what that is is that all business 
including all businesses, including energy business, is, as uh, has already been said two or three times, thrive on certainty, right? We want to have certainty. But uh, the fact of the matter is we, like everyone else, have to make judgments about where we invest capital based upon our projections on supply and demand and other factors that affect markets. And these decisions have become increasingly more difficult uh, lately because of really uh, four recent developments, the success of the oil and gas, uh, unconventional oil and gas, the globalization of the natural gas uh, industry, uh, the shifting in OPEC strategies, and demand destruction in a lot of the oil and gas markets. That is making some of the decisions we make uh, and have to make very difficult. Well, in this sea of uncertainty, and this is the curveball I'm going to throw everybody, in this sea of uncertainty, we've been thrown, the energy industry has been thrown a lifeline. And it's up to us to decide whether we want to grab it. And what is that lifeline? It's the Paris Agreement. If we are looking for certainty, how, how much better certainty can we have than a roadmap that tells us 196 different countries are saying this is our plan to going forward to keep global warming below 2 degrees C, well below 2 degrees C uh, from pre-industrial levels. It's not a prediction. It's not a guess. It's right there. It's for us to, to look at and see. And, and if we don't capture that opportunity and, and move forward with it, we will end up, the destination is the same. As every, I, I totally agree. When the destination is the same, a low carbon economy future, we have two decisions to make. Are we going to lead or are we going to follow? I think we need to lead because the economic opportunities there are, are incredible. So sure, it is, is, uh, as Ernie said, it will require changes in business models. Company executives will have to do that. They will have to abandon activities that no longer make sense. And they will have to restructure their companies to take advantage of this new energy paradigm. But what's the alternative? Do we continue to spend billions of dollars exploring for oil in more remote and costly locations when demand destruction and the reemergence of, of marginal cost pricing in oil and gas markets combine to destroy capital uh, in an unprecedented way? I think the answer to that is no. And I think what I'm focused on is the fact that while climate change may have started out as a moral imperative, it has now be also become an economic necessity. Right. So very, very helpful, Mark, and very important uh, comment. If I could just follow up one minute before I come back to you, John. You mentioned that, that your commitment to this and the transition that you've gone through has elicited uh, skepticism and, and uh, uh, you know, some barbs directed your way. To what do you, I mean, what does that come from? You, you, you're looking at this pretty empirically. You're looking at the evidence. You're looking at the economics of it. It's a pretty good, sound economic decision. It's a future market. It's got you know, growth potential, et cetera, et cetera. What, what, where is this coming from in your mind, this resistance that almost, as I said in my comments, is a kind of mockery? Um, yes. <clears throat> I think it's a, a good part of it is, is fear. Uh, it's uh, a lot of people see, you know, change is, is really the other side of the same coin. Change is no, nothing more than progress. But if you talk to people about progress, the, uh, the reaction you get is a lot different than when you talk to them about change. Mm -hmm. Some people will see change and the opportunities that are there. The others will see it as an existential threat to their business and their way of life. And once that existential threat happens, then I think certain parts of, of the, let's say, the left side of the brain that looks at things analytically shut down. Yeah. And it's the right side, the emotional part of the brain. And, and with that, it's very difficult uh, to, to get those folks to see and have them visualize how they can be successful in the low-carbon economy. Yeah. 
Well, I think that just underscores something. Uh, actually, the Yale Forestry School did a tremendous uh, analysis a number of years ago on the communication of climate change. Very, very important. And I think you're just documenting the fact that if you talk, if you sort of scare people and stand up and you're talking about doomsday and this and that, people tend to shut off and turn off. Did you, it, you, oh, I'm yeah. sorry. Go, no, I was just going to say, yeah, yeah, go, ahead. No, go ahead, John. No, I'm sorry. Well, I, I just going to state the obvious out of that, that, that if you're arguing the economics and the opportunity and the upside and the better life and the better health and all of these other components, you have a much more uh, welcoming argument, I think. No, I was just going to add, because uh, I totally agree with what Mark said, uh, certainly, but the, the issue of change and fear versus opportunity, uh, sure, it goes to people who have the responsibility of running companies and et cetera, but I just wanted to reinforce my last comment about workers and communities as well is uh, a, a similar dynamic, except we should also remember that the change that many workers' communities face involves lots of technology changes that are going on, and then you're asking them to compound that with, the, in their view, the uncertain future of this deeply decarbonized world. And is so, that doable, so, Ernie? Is it doable? I, I, well, it has I, to sure, be, I sure hope so. I'm, I'm certainly going to be working on that yeah. pretty hard over the next few years. Uh, it, ha it has to be, and, uh, and it's the only way that we can do justice to these communities. Uh, frankly, so you know, we so have that to begs the question of what is the most promising or exciting uh, product slash technology approach that you may have come across or are thinking about as a future that would make it easier to do this. But let me, before we answer that, Jonathan Pershing knows as much about this, folks, as anybody I've ever met, and he worked with Ernie. He worked over in the in the energy department before you stole him. Before I stole him from Ernie. And, uh, and we're still talking to each other, as you can see. <laughs> um, that was after I stole them from state. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, he's currently at the Hewlett uh, Packard Foundation and doing uh, the environment programming there, and grant distribution and so forth. So uh, uh, Jonathan, why don't you sort of wrap up a little of what you've heard here from each of the speakers, and then we can kind of focus this a little more on some of the technologies and promises of the future. Great, thanks very much. It's actually a little daunting to sit between the two people I used to work for uh, and try to comment on what they've said, but um, not being particularly shy, uh, let, me, let me start More off. More delicate. Oh, delicate. Let me start off with that. We'll put you in between us so both of us can control this. <laughs> well, I actually wanted to pick up on a couple of things that people said, and then I want to take us in a slightly different additional direction. Uh, and uh, the things that I think people have said here resonate certainly to me. I, I moved from Washington to California and one of the things that I'm struck by is this last conversation we've just had. California is an environment in which people are incredibly optimistic. Uh, the economy is doing well. Tony mentioned this. Uh, the governor managed not just to do the extension of the cap and trade bill, but he decided to do it with a bipartisan effort and got Republicans on side. Uh, stunning kind of an achievement when you think about that. Where is the state on this issue? There is overwhelming support to address it. But the support comes partly because people see jobs in the future. And this speaks to Ernie's point it's not narrowly a function of this is a destructive cycle in which I'm going to lose opportunity. It's perceived as an opportunity growth and as new business models and uh, unconstrained. And I'd like to pivot, if I could, from that to where the rest of the world is because we seem to be unusually cautioned and stuck in a place of fear as, a place of, as opposed to a place of opportunity. Uh, I was in China the week before last. And uh, I took the train from Beijing uh, to uh, Jinan. Jinan is the province of one of the largest, uh, the capital of one of the largest provinces in China, the Shandong province. My guess is that almost nobody here knows where that is. Uh, you are intimately connected with it. They make half of the tires in the world. So if you're driving a car, the odds are good your car's tires were made in the Shandong province. Jinan is a place where the Energy Foundation, which is one of the groups that we've been supporting, has been actively at work in putting together a bus rapid transit system. It's not a single line, it's seven lines. They look like a metro map in the city of Jinan. Jinan is a small second tier city of a mere seven and a half million people. <laughs> I took the train from Beijing to Jinan. It took me two hours and 10 minutes. It's about 500 kilometers. I took the train just now from New York. It took me two hours and 15 minutes. It's 80 miles. <laughs> we have an infrastructure problem and it plays out in the energy discussion. 
It plays out in what happened just recently with the hurricane and the lack of electricity capacity. It plays out in our unwillingness to make major large-scale investments and make no mistake, and this is where I want to pick up on the other comments as well, this is not in our collective national interest. We are not well served by sitting and watching as this happens. And I thought a few additional statistics might actually help uh, put this in motion. I'll be in India next week for some meetings there with folks in their reorganized government. It'll be, I think, an interesting opportunity to see how the Modi administration is carrying the agenda forward. India announced in June that it would end the sale of internal combustion engine vehicles by 2030. India. China's got an announcement of that same sort currently in the works. And that's in addition to their high-speed rail system. And by the way, China built that system over the course of the last 20 years. They've got 14,000 miles of high-speed rail. France and Britain both announced they'd end the sale of ICE cars by 2040. So here's a set of now countries in Europe and in the developing world manufacturing, all indicating a different vision. And to Ernie's point, they're moving down a number of different roads. The majority look like they're going electric, but I think they're going to be some hydrogen, some biofuel. But they're all going to be out of a traditional ICE engine. And what's interesting is even further than that is that VW, in no small measure in response to an environmental constraint around their air pollution problems with diesel, VW announced that it would release pure electric vehicles for every one of its 300 car models. That's an extraordinary reaction to this kind of a deal. It's a reaction that says you can move down this new technology road. The technology is sufficiently advanced that you can make a different pitch for it, a different play for it. You're not in the narrow space of saying, I have to reprise the old one. And an incremental efficiency improvement moving from 25 to 27 miles per gallon is an adequate shift. It is not, and this is a set of companies that's moving in a different direction, and a set of countries that are incentivizing that structure. I think one of the other things that's been talked about here a little bit is that the electricity and energy side is much wider than the narrow vision of the power structure. We have to think about this in terms of electrifying almost everything and where we can't substituting for different forms of energy that are not carbon intensive. And here I want to pick up on the second piece and the theme that Ernie raised at the beginning and I think is really worth elevating. Not a single model that any of us have seen suggests that you get to an 80% reduction with today's technologies without some carbon negative approaches. They all require it. Now, it doesn't mean in 10 years that we might not find some alternatives. It means that what we understand about our system today does not enable that outcome over the course of the next 35 years. The models don't converge. And that's assuming that all of these difficult infrastructure problems are addressed. That's assuming that the regulatory environment is modified and managed in such a way that you're not constrained by historical anachronism because that has huge political weight. To assume you can make those shifts, even then it's not sufficient. So what are we doing on negative emissions? What are we doing on carbon capture and storage? The United States had led this particular agenda. Secretary Moniz, when he was in the Energy Department, an active and ad, uh, advocate for it. His predecessor, Steve Chu, also a strong supporter. I was at Lawrence Livermore Lab uh, last Friday and had a series of conversations with the lab directors and the team at the lab around what they were doing in this agenda. And it was much more optimistic than the things that I had been hearing only literally a year ago. They have new technologies. They're working on opportunities for land management, for soil sequestration. They're looking at potential direct air capture. The budget was cut to almost zero. There is no other country making this investment. China is investing with the presumption that if there's a return on it, they will move forward. But if there's no return, if they can't see an immediate economic return, they won't do it. We were one of the only places prepared to make a longer term investment in an agenda that was essential because it mattered so much to our future. And it was not exclusively an immediate quarterly return on profits. And the private sector has almost entirely backed away from this program. I want to turn to a slightly more optimistic frame, though, at the other end of the international spectrum to leave perhaps a bit more sense of positivity in the structure. So as was noted, and, and uh, I think Tony mentioned this and, and Mark also, we've got over 190 countries who signed on to Paris. And there are many in this room, not least the secretary, who worked to make this deal happen. The United States right now is unique in having backed away from it. The rest of the world is actually moving forward on it. And the rest of the world looks like it's on track. 
things are moving well. Now, it's only the first increment. We're going to have to iterate. But countries are doing what they said they would do. The major players have stood up and made these kinds of announcements. They're beginning to put investments on the table. There are, in many cases, carbon prices. There are carbon trading programs. There are technology investments. There are regulatory environments for feed-in tariffs, for industrial standards. These are the agendas that the world is moving to. And if I take a look at where this is going to go, I think one last story illustrates this very well. When I was in China, I had a chance to see the former uh, negotiator from China, whom both secretaries know well, uh, Xie Zhenhua, who's the vice minister for the NDRC and is the special envoy. He's likely to step down in the context of the new party congress. But he and I had a couple of hours to exchange views about where China was moving. And one of the things that came up in that discussion was an initiative called One Belt, One Road. Many of you may have heard about this, but it's made remarkably little headway in the international discourse, at least currently, in Washington. This is an agenda that basically follows the trade routes, the old Silk Road trade routes that gave China some of its early rise several hundred years ago. And it's looking to bind together in a new economic paradigm a model of international trade. They have put this in a number of different ministries, but one of the key people in the NDRC is the former climate negotiator who's charged with greening one belt, one road. So the question to me is, can we help them? What will it take to bring our technology, our know-how to that process? Can we take the new ideas of new alternative models for the future that are zero carbon and make them part of that? Because notwithstanding Secretary Kerry's investment in Vietnam of his own personal time, China's in there with undercutting numbers on coal, coal manufacturing. And notwithstanding the fact that we've got really interesting agendas in India where they're announcing intent to remove their uh, fossil fuel fleet from the oil side in cars, they're investing still across the board in fossil technologies with Chinese money. And notwithstanding the fact that you've got a major investment from the World Bank in Nigeria, the cheapest option is coal from China. If we can't find ways to invest with them and work with them, not very optimistic, but there's an avenue, there's a pathway. There are processes that we can engage in that probably make this possible. Thanks. John, can I just add? Absolutely. Uh, uh, Jonathan mentioned the one, the one belt, one road. But just to put numbers on this, uh, in the context of the earlier discussion, uh, they are talking about putting $1 trillion into ports, roads, pipes, wires, you name it. Uh, to, uh, to, to, to create business, to create a new economic paradigm, yep. as, as you said. And we can invest anything, even domestically, yep. in this country. This is the case where I think the president, uh, hopefully, will follow through on one of his campaign promises and, and work by, in a bipartisan way <coughs> to get a big infrastructure push in this country, which includes energy infrastructure, electricity system being, being, being a good example. It's, it's really... Uh, a stunning contrast. Uh, the other thing I will just say as well, and Jonathan and I are on the same page as we talked about large-scale carbon management, but just to go back, John, to the earlier comment I made, why I think that we don't have the tools uh, that we need for the deep decarbonization beyond the Paris horizon, is just to say, for example, we talked about all the various electrification of vehicles. Those discussions are essentially all for light-duty vehicles. Yeah. There's an, there's an enormous issue that we, we don't know how to solve. And then let me add to that industry. It, I mean, electricity, it's, we can all can see the pathway to the deep decarbonization. I have a hard time seeing that for industry, for example, uh, highly dispersed, uh, et, et cetera. So we've got a lot of work to do yet uh, for the full economy in deep decarbonization. So I think that those comments, both of Ernie and of Jonathan, underscore the degree to which uh, a decision not to do something, even though it's not a decision, but although Heather mentioned the rollbacks, et cetera, but there is a yet unquantified opportunity cost here that is just staggering. And I think one of the important things that we need to do in the context of this conference and afterwards, I would say to our fellows here, is try to quantify that even more effectively. Uh, example, I mean, 
I want to pick up on this train thing. I, I also was in China not so long ago, and I rode on the train from Beijing down to the coast. And I was secretary, and they were proud to show me how effective this train was. And I sat up in the uh, you know front cabin, and the steward came and put water on my table. We were going 300 miles an hour. And so help me God, the water was not moving in my glass. <laughs> And I just came away, from, I just, you know, when you look at the tens of thousands of miles they have built, ask you in the audience or anywhere, name me one great project being built in the United States of America. I mean, remember the time of Robert Moses, you can think of all the, we're just riding on old infrastructure, we're riding on old investment, investment of a prior generation. But current generation, future, there's nothing in the prospect of this. And you look at the Acela, God bless it. Uh, <laughs> from Washington to New York, this is a train, and I rode on it yesterday. I rode to, to uh, New York in, uh, you know, in the evening and came back early in the morning. Um, that train can go 150 miles an hour, and it's advertised as doing so. But I inquired a couple of years ago. I said, well, tell me, where does it go 150 miles an hour? And between Washington and New York, the total of that mileage that is hitting 150 miles an hour is 18 miles. <laughs> Why? Because underneath the tunnel of Baltimore, it cannot go fast because the vibrations may implode the tunnel. It falls <laughs> in on it. It can't go over those beautiful Chesapeake uh, Bridges, because the train will wind up in the Chesapeake <laughs> instead of on the rails. I mean, this is unfathomable for us, frankly. And, I mean, you could look at our airports. And here's the deal. I wrote and drafted the infrastructure bill in the Senate. And we worked with Goldman Sachs. We worked with the Bank of England. We worked with the Infrastructure Bank of Europe. We did, I thought, a really good job putting together a bill. And for $10 billion of federal investment, if you have a discount, at the Fed window, in order to create a spread in your investments, you could attract 600 to $650 billion of investment from the private sector in transportation, water, and energy projects. Why? Because they're revenue producing, and they will give you a return on investment that is far better than the $13 trillion that is currently sitting in net negative interest status around the world. And we're not doing it. So this is really one of the great uh, stunning failures. And for every $1 billion of infrastructure investment, you create 27,000 to 35,000 jobs. So when you look at the issue of putting people to work, you look at the issue of you know, sort of future work and challenges of the workplace today and artificial intelligence and technology, here's a ready-made solution to this question of building American employment and the future. Plus. We don't have a national grid in America. We have a great big hole in the middle of America. We cannot sell energy from Texas windmills or Iowa windmills or Minnesota windmills, which I became very familiar with a number of years ago. Can't sell it. We can't sell Massachusetts wind energy to other parts of the country because we don't have a grid that has the ability to make that transmission. You have East Coast grid, West Coast grid, a line that goes from Chicago across the north, and Texas, of course, has its own grid. So, you know, we, we desperately need to be doing this. And uh, leading me to the question, I was struck by Ernie's comment about deep carbonization, decarbonization. And I'd like to tackle that a little more here. What, if anything, have any of you come across, or, or, or do you feel? If you, were the, you could write the thing tomorrow, Ernie, and it would be implemented. What would you do to move to the deep carbonization? Oh, you mean if? I mean, if, if. Uh, well, for one thing, and Jonathan alluded to it, uh, frankly, uh, for things like the large-scale carbon management uh, issues, right now it is a big research program that we need. Uh, we we really don't have uh, some of the science. You're talking about industry more than the uh, I, I light think, vehicle. I, I think for, for for much of this, uh, uh, the government uh, funding would be very important. I think industry would be a partner, but this is the kind of you know the the, the return is way way off. Uh, much of it is very is very fundamental res uh, research. 
Again, a lot of it is life science research in, in terms of the whole uh, uh, terrestrial uh, challenge for, uh, for being a big, uh, big, big carbon sink. And I think, frankly, and, and David uh, could comment, uh, certainly, but I, I also think uh, for, for underground, for you know, subsurface sequestration, uh, I think there's still a lot of research uh, uh, that we need for the scale that we are talking about. Uh, uh, so, so I think right now, if I were writing it, I, I would write a very, very large uh, uh, R&D program. So what do we for, get for that for component? Right. You talked about full electrification. Wait a minute. Can, I, can I also just add yeah. one thing on the earlier discussion? I, I want to make the first legislative proposal of this panel. Uh, uh, the uh, Department of Energy uh, still has approximately $40 billion of loan authority that is being looked at to be eliminated in a, in, with no impact on the, on the budget. Right. Why don't we make sure the language for that loan program explicitly includes devoting it to energy infrastructure? That would be a pretty nice little down payment on a whole bunch of very, very important uh, work. But can I, can I jump in on that? Because yeah, go ahead. There are areas that we can focus on if we look at it holistically. I mean, there's been a focus in the last decade or so on renewable energy, and it's, we've made tremendous progress. But right now in California, that has driven down electricity sector to 20% of carbon emissions, whereas transportation sector is almost 50% when you include refining, 40% from the vehicles themselves. And we need to focus there. I mean, Ernie mentioned the industrial sector. If you get electricity generation um, down to a low enough carbon footprint, you'll, want to, you'll use more electricity to replace some of the, the carbon emitting technology. But on the electric side of the business, um, you know, and lots of people blame the auto companies. And I have full disclosure, I'm on the board of Ford Motor Company, but how many of you drive an electric vehicle? Are there either a, a full electric or a plug-in hybrid? So this is a group of dedicated people who know the subject, maybe 10%. There are 17 different nameplate models out there that you can buy, ranging from about $20,000 to $110,000 Tesla. Uh, now, some of the issues are infrastructure. In California, we've been fighting the, the battle. California, you think it'd be easy. We proposed to install 25,000 public charging stations. We have had a pitched battle. And you've got, so labor gets involved because they want to do well. Well, you know, if it gets union labor, some of it's just not economic uh, on some of these smaller projects. Um, you get some of the charging station manufacturing companies who get in and they want to skim the cream, so they don't want a large-scale program because then there's not enough cream to skim. So, to skim. Uh, so there, are, there are issues unrelated to the environment, uh, including consumer preferences. And by the way, driving an electric vehicle is really fun. Uh, they are really great cars. But those are the things we need to start to tackle. Well, so assuming, I, I'm sorry, go ahead. Okay. I, would, I would also add, it's when you start talking about tackling these challenges around energy infrastructure. There is, I mean, we all dealt with the challenges of pipelines, transmission lines, trying to get these things cited is much more difficult. The oil and gas industry, I mean, if we're talking about legislative solutions, the oil and gas industry has imminent domain. Nobody in the renewable side has that. So I, I just, I think it's important to- well. We did approve the you clean line, <laughs> uh, and I can show you the scars. I, well, trust me, we both have them, my friend. But, um, but, but that was an ugly, long process that's still ongoing and not that fast. My, I guess my point is just we can talk about the need to fund energy infrastructure, but I also think it's equally important to solve for the other side of this, which is that I mean, can you cite transmission lines in California all that easily? It's very difficult. Right. So we just need to be, we need to be thoughtful when we're so, talking about sure. policy. So let's assume that we, what do we get for full electrification? Where does that leave us in terms of the decarbonization footprint, Ernie, that you're talking about that we need? Uh, I don't know. You mean if we had full, if everything were electrified? No. If, no, no. if, if the transportation industry. Or transport were electrified. Light duty or heavy duty as right. well? Both? Can you get heavy duty? That we're not capable at this point. Well, do I some think, modal switching into yeah. rail, which could do some of it. 
There's yeah. some open possibility you could produce hydrogen with a clean electricity, and therefore it's a, pr a product yeah. of electrification yes. that might move. Yeah, but yeah. what are exactly. we going to do about air? Directly, but it's and, hot and, air, and, right? I and I think, uh, but I think that's the hydrogen is, that's the is model, right? and and also for industry, yeah. hydrogen could be uh, again a replacement for some of the liquid fuel requirements that are not going to easily be met by a, by a battery. Do you have any uh, but, sense, I mean, I know research is ongoing and people are pushing the limits, but is there any sense of uh, time frame on that? Of how far I think, from commercialization well, well, first of all, first of all, look, first of all, of course, you could do it right now. Exactly. I mean, uh, there's no problem uh, you having a zero carbon source, renewables, nuclear, uh, doing electrolysis <coughs> of water. The, Trump, the, the issue is it's ec economic, uh, economic, especially when, uh, as you were implicitly saying in your coal discussion, when so many environmental impacts are not being internalized. For example, that was a long way of saying, where's the carbon price, uh, right? I mean, a substantial <laughs> carbon price. Uh, so, uh, so a lot of this is going to, is, going to be, uh, is going to be cost. And frankly, you know, the other thing is, I think we've said it in many ways in this discussion, but just to say it very explicitly, uh, what we really need is the synergy of technology and policy. Uh, if we're going to accelerate, uh, we did some modeling uh, back in when Jonathan was was uh, in, in pre pre theft days uh, when he was at DOE uh, that uh, that it was remarkable to see the way even modest policy put in through a carbon price changed dramatically the acceleration of deploy of deployment of the clean energy technologies. So if you get those signals working together, uh, we can make progress rapidly. Uh, but right now, that's not the, not, not the system. I, I got to endorse what Ernie says about synergizing development of technology and policy. They, they work hand in hand. I mean, one of the problems California has, you sometimes get the policymakers getting way out ahead of the technology, yeah. uh, and that creates problems. But, but one but, piece but, of advice. But you've changed the laws of physics, haven't yeah. you, in California? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. <laughs> um, make sure you do not say that there are no great projects going on when Jerry Brown is here tomorrow, because <laughs> he'll tell you the high speed rail project in California is one. And interestingly, it's being paid for by cap and trade revenues. Mm -hmm. So it, it's kind of an interesting model mm -hmm. where we're using cap and trade revenues to drive some infrastructure <coughs> interesting. investment. Could I get back just one yeah, thing? Because it, it feeds into what we're talking about here, and that's back to my favorite roadmap, the Paris Agreement. And in, in looking at the nationally determined contributions and what how everyone's planning with a little more detail, I think there's probably 30, 30 of them talk about natural gas being a part of it, but almost everyone talks about energy efficiency. And, and so I, I think, you know, electrification is, is good and deep decarbonization is, is good as well. But if we want to seize on where the real opportunities are, um, if you look at it just from the standpoint, I think the Lawrence Laboratory puts out that, that diagram that shows how much energy input and how much is actually used beneficially used, mm -hmm. and I think about 57% is wasted, just wasted. And so there's a huge opportunity there in energy efficiency, so but I would not, in yeah, I was say and the here's a part about terminology, I think it's important when you talk about grassroots level and the folks that, that really go, oh, that makes a difference to me. When you talk about efficiency, it's sort of like, well, you're telling me I don't know what I'm doing. You talk about energy productivity, and it's totally different. It's how much more productive can the energy be? Then it goes to how much product, how much more productive can our economy be? And then it's how much more competitive can we be in the global economy? Mm -hmm. Globalization 1.0 has not turned out very well for a lot of people in the country. I think we're given an opportunity here with globalization 2.0 to make it turn out a lot better. So each of you has described a uh, one complication or another, regulatory, timing, research, commitment of the federal government. I mean, there are a lot of pieces here that have got to come together and gel on something that is obviously urgent. And time is perhaps the one thing we don't have the most on our side, uh, if you have a fair analysis of, of the challenge. And I think we've been fair about it. So the question is, therefore, does uh, a number of years ago, when in the first years of the Obama administration, we were trying, Tony, we were trying to get the, uh, you know, a, yep. a bill through the Senate which contemplated nuclear. Nuclear industry was at the table. 
Now, nuclear is zero emissions, uh, and we've had a program that has worked in the United States Navy for 70 years or so. It propels ships on the seas. We've never lost a sailor. One of the reasons is human redundancy in the program, uh, and uh, you know it's, it's a different kind of cost analysis because of how it's produced. But fourth generation modular is something people have talked about. We have a system right now which is a one-off system. You, you just build like the southern plant and everything has to be built new and designed and it's slow and it's expensive. And also there are, of course, Fukushima and other uh, clouds hanging over that industry. But is this, given the urgency, something that should be compacted into a federal policy where you do have a modular, one size, you know, small, safe uh, a pipeline for supply that reduces cost, and would that help us with respect to the urgency of this? Or are we so far down the road with the other technologies and the and wind, solar, hydro, bio, et cetera, that we just don't need to. Can you comment on that? Yeah, so, so I spent five years of my life as an officer on a nuclear submarine. Um, I think it's a, all three of the companies that I've run have owned and operated nuclear plants. It's a great technology. But I would not try to build a, a nuclear, a, certainly a Gen 3 nuclear plant in the U.S. right now. I actually, at, my, at DT Energy, we got a license to build uh, a GE ESBWR, and it's just sitting, it's never going to get built. Um, you do need to move to the Gen 4 is inherently safe, modular, so you don't have the huge front end cost. But is there, that's going to take some government money to really fund the research because it's beyond any individual company. Here's a southern company building you know, a large twin unit nuclear plant, and that's one of the biggest companies in the U.S., and they're struggling with that. But is it your recommendation that we should, in fact, do that because that could accelerate the capacity to do what we have to do? We, we have to, not only for energy, but also for defense issues. We're going to lose the nuclear supply base to support the Navy's program uh, here in the U.S. because the Chinese are building nuclear plants. I, I've been to some new construction uh, nuclear plants in Russia. They're going ahead uh, with nuclear construction. Uh, so all over the world, it's going ahead, and they're leaving us behind. And I think, if I'm correct, France has, what, 70 percent, 80 percent of its energy base is nuclear? 75. Has been for a long time. Ernie, you wanted to comment And on going this. down to 50, according to their policy. Right. Uh, well, first of all, I'll, I'll, let me reinforce uh, everything that Tony said and just add a, add a few things. Uh, uh, first of all, it, it's an interesting perspective uh, if you look at capital costs. Um, uh, let's say, <laughs> this is looking optimistic, but let's say a nuclear power plant of the current mega variety, you know, a gigawatt or gigawatt plus plant, uh, let's call it $8 a watt of capital cost, okay? Um, you look at solar, let's call it $2 a watt. Maybe it's a bit less than $2 a watt now for utility scale. However, the nuclear power plant has a capacity factor of 92%. The solar, let's call it 20%. So let's, let's say it's a, four, a factor of four and a half. Well, what matters is the kilowatt hours you make. That's how you make money. So if you take the capacity factor weighted capital cost, they're very comparable. But you don't have to buy 1,200 megawatts of solar at once. There are other issues, as Tony referred to, or you referred to as well, John. But, you know, but just to put it in perspective, uh, but as Tony says, right now, I just cannot see any American utility stepping forward to put that kind of capital at risk, uh, uh, even in the Southeast, again, with their regulatory structure right now. So the, uh, yet it's a very, very important part of the toolkit uh, for, for low carbon. So going to modular reactors, uh, uh, I, I, I am quite interested in modular reactors. So this is, for example, there's one from New Scale uh, sitting before the NRC right now, uh, which is a 50 megawatt, 5-0. So that's the very, very different financial structure that Tony referred to, but as John implied, the hope is that 
such reactors, small reactors, could have an attractive capital structure as well through the economies of manufacturing on a production line in a plant. But you don't build a production line to make one. So that's where I think that, and I, I will be very explicit, I think that the right policy approach is for the government to, uh, through some mechanism, it can be various subsidies, tax credits, or it can be simply long-term purchase power agreements for big federal facilities, DOE facilities, Department of Defense facilities, and you gotta say, look, we gotta take the leap and say, let's order 20 of these 50 megawatt things, that's only a gigawatt, and, uh, but get somebody, then somebody in industry steps forward to build a production line and really, and really test the proposition. Now, those are, going, those are still going to be light water reactor technologies today. But there are, what's very interesting is in the private sector, a great example is called TerraPower, uh, uh, where it's a more advanced technology that also uh, reduces the long-term nuclear waste management problems, potentially, if, if they can ever work. But you know what? Going back to one belt, one road, to be honest, they don't see how they can build a prototype and get it licensed in the United States. Mm -hmm. They're going to go elsewhere with that, even though it's all American, American uh, uh, technology. And finally, on the point that Tony raised about the, uh, the national security implications, I'll advertise, if you go to the Energy Futures Initiative website, you can find a paper that we did about a month and a half ago on the national security implications of maintaining a strong nuclear supply chain in the United States. One part of it is that we have set the non-proliferation standards basically through our historic dominance of the nuclear supply chain. That is going away. Maybe I'll just give a few factoids. Uh, and I'm not claiming all this will get built. But Egypt has got an agreement with Russia to build four nuclear power plants. Saudi Arabia has an agreement with Russia to build 16 nuclear power plants. Turkey has an agreement with Russia to build four nuclear power plants. Iran had their German plant, after many decades, finished by Russia, and they have an agreement with Russia to build three more. Ironically, the one exception is the Emirates, with whom we do have a strong nonproliferation agreement. So they chose to buy South Korean reactors. So, <laughs> So it gives you an idea to also the geopolitical picture is one that is very, very troubling uh, uh, from our nonproliferation perspective, not to mention the supply chain. Okay, I'll add one more thing, John, sorry. <laughs> but since, since you are both Navy guys, we cannot meet the Navy's needs down the road because we do not have an American technology for uranium enrichment. We cannot meet our needs. We are living off of an inventory, and if we don't get on this in the next few years, we're not gonna be able to do this. So anyway, nuclear is, very, is a very important focal area for both climate and, uh, and, and natural security. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, uh, Jonathan, you mentioned earlier uh, the, I think you used the term full uh, electrification. Can you describe, what do you mean by full electrification? So I think there, there are a couple of things here, and, and a number of others have actually mentioned this, but you could imagine uh, most immediately uh, the power sector could be decarbonized. One can think about how you could do that, whether it's a nuclear a combined fleet or not, whether it's capture and storage, some collection of technologies. But you can then begin to electrify other sectors. You can certainly electrify the light duty vehicle fleet. We now have probably capacity to do, I would argue, about 95% of the fleet. There are some remote uh, places you can't do it as easily, but you can do the vast majority of the fleet. You can electrify some parts of the heavy duty fleet. I think it's mostly through modal shifting and probably in the space of looking towards rail, which clearly could be electrified. You don't currently have the capacity to do all of it. We don't have the capacity to electrify aviation. We haven't managed to electrify marine. So there's a whole subset that doesn't work. On the industry side, 
there's a clear indication you can electrify some pieces. I can go, for example, to an electric arc furnace as opposed to a high temperature uh, boiler and reactor for steel. But that's a pretty small subset of the existing suite of industrial technologies. So heat, much, much better to produce not with electricity, doesn't work as well. And you have process problems. I don't uh, change the way I uh, make certain kinds of chemicals. I need to manage those through a heat product, and that's often gas. And if I look at that, that's not amenable at the moment with our technology for electrification. But at the other end, I could electrify almost everything in this building. I could electrify the heating. I could electrify the cooling. I could electrify the lighting. I could take your microwave power. All of that could go electric. So it's a couple of sectors that look like they're going to be really, really problematic. I'd put industry and heavy-duty vehicles at the top of the list of difficulties. And then finally, even if we do that, collectively energy is about two-thirds of the global total. We need the other third. The other third is some combination of agriculture and forestry and land use discussions. None of that is amenable to electricity, and we now therefore need to go negative to manage all of those pieces as well. So it's a larger agenda. So, and can I add, John, on the, going back to the light duty vehicle the comment that Jonathan made, that again, an example of the way we need, and I don't know how we get it in our political system, um, uh, uh, much more uh, integrated planning. Fortunately, this, the example I will give now can occur more at the, at, the, at, the, at the urban area level, and that is that, look, electric vehicles and serious rethinking, including autonomous vehicles, yeah. uh, new, and new business models uh, for it, uh, integrating what that can do into fundamental urban design issues is an enormous opportunity uh, for quality of life, for new services, and for good environment. Uh, but, you know, we need, it's hard to bring all of these threads together effectively. Let me just put on that, and it's a really interesting number that, I, that we worked on at DOE. So if you took all of the power that's in your street lights, just take your street lights, all your cities have got street lights, and convert them from what's often now being used, those really bright arc lamps, and turn them into LEDs. The difference in the cost that the city spends on the electricity would be more than enough to pay for a charger at every street lamp. It's kind of an interesting statistic, right? These are not enormous numbers. It requires an infrastructure change. It requires some kind of investment. It requires a public policy choice. But the numbers are well within our grasp. And police departments are allies. And they are. For this. So, uh, folks, we're sort of coming to uh, a moment where we've got to begin to wrap up on this uh, this panel, obviously we could go on considerably longer. Um, what leaps out at me as I, as I listen to this, and Ernie, I want to ask you before we wrap up, but I want to ask each of you to kind of give a sense of the takeaway uh, uh, based on what you've heard from other members as well as your own thinking. But uh, Ernie, I want you to, if you would, share with folks what you and I have been thinking about in terms of the staying with Paris effort uh, and, and, and trying to create a uh, capacity for people to find a place to target something very specific and so forth, which I think is important to this, because what I think must be hitting you, and it certainly hits me, is, and I've been at this for a long time, but when you dig down like this and you begin to get into these choices, you recognize uh, the politics of this are daunting. This is, uh, it's hard enough if you have somebody in DOE and somebody in the White House and somebody in the State Department all pushing in the same direction. It's still hard. And we don't have that right now. We don't have a pushing in the same direction. That goes into the opportunity cost loss that I was talking about. But the question is how do you create uh, the big steps? How do you implement the big steps that are going to make the biggest difference here that can affect the marketplace? Because no one, I think, should forget the marketplace in this. The marketplace is perhaps one of the most powerful tools we have. Money behaves in certain ways. And people who are running big companies and looking for the future are going to make decisions, and they already have. That's why Fortune 500 companies said, don't get out of Paris, because people are betting on that future in a certain way now. And that is going to begin to happen even more. And that accelerates on itself. Nobody can predict who the next Elon Musk or 
Sergey Brin, Larry Page, whatever is going to be or what it's going to bring us. Could there be a breakthrough here of some kind? Because the market is so attractive that the innovative, creative energies of the nation, and that's one thing we are the best at and good at still, are going to apply themselves to this particular challenge. And, and um, you know, I'm sort of betting on that. I, I personally believe that that may be the saving grace in all of this uh, in the end. But without that, um, we obviously have some big policy choices to begin to pressure and to create and get Congress literally to behave differently on this. It's almost, and we're going to talk about this in the last session with Leonardo DiCaprio, probably talk about it a couple times before that, is creating the energy and momentum at the grassroots level that holds our politics accountable. When I was here at Yale, uh, Rachel Carson had just written Silent Spring, and there was a growing environmental movement in the country, and that produced the outcomes of the clean energy, safe, safe water, clean drinking, uh, you know, Marine Mammal Protection, Clean Air Act, ultimately the EPA itself, uh, which wasn't created until 1972. But it came about because of grassroots accountability. And that's a whole other part of what has to come out of this conference, I think. But Ernie, why don't you just share a thought about so what we're thinking of doing to try to add one tool in the effort to do that? Well, for, first, as, as prologue to, to, to that, John, I wanna, let me just say that, again, we've, I think we've all agreed about this importance of the synergy of technology and policy. Let me make it very clear, I have absolutely complete confidence on the technology side uh, that at least with appropriate investment, uh, we're, going to, uh, we're going to keep making the kinds of progress we, we have made and we will make it in some of these other domains that we have described as, as, as critical. Now, I actually happen to be also reasonably optimistic on the policy side. And it starts with, uh, that starts with the fact that we have had uh, really mayors and governors uh, as, as leaders uh, and, and that continues and I think our history is that eventually the bubbling in different states uh, kind, of, you know, kind of comes together into a federal boil eventually uh, and uh, with, with public support uh, that, will, that will happen again. So after the president, uh, president's announcement on June 1st uh, on the Paris Accord, as was already said, the mayors and governors and business leaders came out in an enormous wave of statement that we're going to stay this course. Partly it's everything from mayors recognizing the quality of life issues and the expense that will be associated with not moving forward to businesses as said uh, thought they had a roadmap, thought there was a plan and the last thing we needed was a little hand grenade tossed in. What we think is now, John and I have been talking and we want to move forward uh, uh, with, with something on, on this, is that what we think is needed now is to get some kind of uh, uh, activity, muscular activity, that brings to get together data, facts, analysis, that brings those together in a way that can be used, can be built from by all of these different players who are coming from their own perspectives, kind of put it together in their own way for their own purposes, but to have some, but what we can't have is cacophony uh, because that then, Frank, to be perfectly honest, it makes it too easy to pick apart and to, and to, and to keep delaying the game that we don't have time, we don't have time for. So that's what John and I are talking about, uh, about uh, uh, pulling together and we'll be looking for, for a lot of help on that. Uh, let me ask you to be able to wrap up with you, Jonathan, but uh, Tony, Heather, Mark, each uh, just make a final comment drawing on the panel today. Well, Ernie is exactly right. I think right now we're in a, a stage where we've got to depend upon the mayors and governors to, to take the lead and to have industry step up. How many companies, you know, have their, their sustainability policies? policies? Uh, we've all got to step up and, and demand the policies and the infrastructure to support that. So what did Bill de Blasio said? Nothing but electric vehicles in midtown Manhattan between eight o'clock in the morning and five o'clock at night. Incredible transformation. Now, the state of New York would have to allow Con Ed to build charging stations or you have to coordinate policy. That would be a game changer. And then the auto companies, so then they'd start building um, transit 
uh, delivery vans and sprinter vans that were all electrified. So there are things that can be done on a small scale that can drive policy that all of a sudden it will be so economic and such a no-brainer that it'll spread. Heather? So we've spent a lot of time today talking about what we can do in the United States, but we have to remember that today there are still over a billion people that have no access to energy and three billion people that are using really clean, uh, really, um, they, they have no access to clean, clean cooking. So when we are thinking about identifying opportunities in the near term, we know that deployment of renewables in these communities to get in front of the curve. I mean, people oftentimes talk about leapfrog technology, right? We didn't build up a bunch of telephone lines across sub-Saharan Africa because people were able to leapfrog to, um, to mobile phones. And I think there's a real opportunity here. Um, I think the program that was launched, Sustainable Energy for All, between the UN, NGOs, universities, again, like taking it outside of, of Washington to find solutions that are workable, um, I, you know, I think that is an area where we can continue to make a lot of progress because we know with additional populations coming in to middle income, additional population growth, we have to be mindful of how we are engaging and where we're taking these technologies in the global level as well. Can um, I just add to that? I just and add to Heather's point that, of course, a lot of those least developed countries are going to need a lot of help in adaptation. Absolutely. And that's what that's all about. Mark. Um, I would wrap up with this. First of all, I agree with everyone here in terms of the importance of policy uh, and technology. And, and I, I just coined the phrase that uh, policy much, must match possibility. We all talk about possibilities, but they will only remain things in our mind and not out there implemented if we don't have the policies to match the possibilities. Uh, to do that, I think we have to have the right messages to get public opinion to support the policymakers or it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. And in order for us to drive that public opinion for supporting these policy changes, we need to identify what the different motivators for change are for people. And, and, and Heather just brought it up. I think one of the other things I was going to mention here is, is w as we talk about uh, dealing with the issue of climate change and, 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 uh, and, and making things happen, I think we also have to talk about, in that same time, recognizing economic growth, uh, because that's the first thing you're going to hear from folks that don't want to have this change is, well, you're going to kill jobs, you're going to kill economic growth. So we have to keep that into consideration. Energy security is another thing that, that needs to be talked about, because I think a lot of times people in our industry are looking at decisions that they believe are going to be made uh, in, in China and India with respect to energy use, but they're thinking with an American brain and not so much thinking with somebody who may be more concerned about their own energy security and why should I do that because I've got some long-term issues. And of course, energy access. And the last thing I would mention on that, uh, and uh, maybe you did that on purpose, maybe you didn't, but just assuming you did, uh, we're involved in a project in Malawi. And one of the things, Chris Smith back at DOE, um, uh, told me a uh, uh, story when he was in, uh, I believe, Tanzania, and, and he was trying to convince them that, that there are ways to get to where we are today without going through all the mistakes that we made here in the United States. And I told him, I got a project in Malawi that we've been working on for six years, and I said, what you ought to do is have those folks come down there and actually see what is possible. Don't talk about theoretical things. But we started out just fixing water wells for people, we ended up having a, um, uh, a little clinic, which is now a region, certified as a regional hospital that has two surgery theaters that are um, equipped to U.S. standards. We have ophthalmological equipment that can do cataract surgeries. We have tilapia ponds where we're raising tilapia. We've got organic egg growing business, and every bit of it is run on wind and solar. So it can be done, and I can tell you if the, these people are getting access to these uh, dramatic changes that enhance their quality of life much sooner than they ever would have thought about doing it if we went the old route of building the big coal fire facility, natural gas facility, and try to bring the wires out to them at the end. Mm -hmm. Jonathan. So just uh, wrap up. One, one very quick comment that brings us back to the Paris discussion where I think you started, which I think has an enormous scope uh, that all of us are using as a way to track both certainty and next directions. 
And one of the things we don't talk about very often in that agreement is a paragraph that was put in that talked about 2050. And instead of saying, what's the next thing I'm going to do? What's the next iteration of my incremental change that I want? It pushes us in a different direction. It says, where do I want to be? What's the vision that I have for my energy economy, for my carbon and climate economy at the middle of the century? And then you work back from that and think about how you deliver that outcome. And it's a deep decarbonization outcome. We did one in the United States just before the end of the term. Uh, Germany's done one. France has done one. The UK has done one. Mexico's done one. They all have a vision for deep decarbonization, 80 to 95% below essentially 2005 levels by the year 2050. And I think what it gives you are not just one template, but dozens of ways you could approach the problem. They're tailored. They're going to be perfect for individual players. They're going to play at the state level, at the city level, at the corporate level, at different national levels. And I think what we've got in Paris is therefore a roadmap for that. And it has to be followed up. And we have to implement it. And we have to take on seriously all of these opportunities because I think it was, was famously said a number of years ago, it's not a silver bullet, it's silver buckshot. And you have to hit all of these targets going forward. Well, folks, I think that uh, this has been a, a really excellent, extraordinary beginning of digging in here. Uh, it has been filled with both promise and uh, uh, challenges, which is as it ought to be. Uh, the one thing I would say, uh, Mark uh, mentioned other countries and what they're doing. In Copenhagen, when the meeting failed to come up with any kind of an agreement, there was a block of the G77 led by China. And they uh, refused, basically, to do anything until the developed countries, who are the primary responsibilities for climate change, uh, had moved adequately to prove that they were serious about doing something. So we were stuck. And when I became secretary, within the first six weeks of being secretary, first trip after I went to Europe was to China, in an effort to persuade the Chinese that we had to change that dynamic. Uh, and we did. We got the Chinese to agree to do a working group with a view to getting the two presidents to be able to stand up and announce their intended emissions reductions so that we could create a different block going to Paris. And I did that partly because I had the searing experience of managing Kyoto on the floor of the Senate when we had a command and control structure that had fixed requirements for every country and there was just a rebellion. People were not going to accept uh, in the new paradigm some globally imposed, <coughs> externally required mandate on the United States of America because Nobody tells us what to do, and we're free to go out and you know, pursue our own goals, et cetera. So it was a real clash, if you will, back then of possibilities. We've changed all that, but we're still in a critical place where we had trouble finding $100 billion for Green Fund to be able to empower countries sufficiently that they would sign up even to Paris, which was voluntary. We spent about $3 trillion in Afghanistan and Iraq, and uh, we continue to pour these extraordinary sums of money into lots of different things. We're paying, I think we paid something like $55 billion for 10 storms last year, just to give you a comparative sense of our priorities and where we're heading. So what you've heard here from these panelists is a lot of wisdom, a lot of experience that clarifies how imperative it is for us to stay engaged with the world, to prove to the world we're not going to allow nation states to disappear, as some will, unfortunately, almost inevitably in the Pacific Ocean and elsewhere. We're, we're facing the challenge of climate refugees, massive migration that may take place as a consequence of changes in the production of food, changes in the availability of water, fights and conflicts that may take place over that water. And this is really daunting in, in that regard if we don't find the policy and create the marketplace choices. So this has been a really, I think, uh, excellent introduction to uh, the discussions we're going to have over the course of the next two days. The next session will be at 2.30 over at the School of Management. 
when we will hear private sector approaches, the exclusive private sector approaches to this energy choice, and we'll hear from the CEOs and companies that are deeply engaged in this, trying to both be responsible personally in the choices they're making, as well as try to affect the marketplace to move in the right direction in other ways. So I hope you will join me in expressing great thanks to each of these very busy, now I listened to this guy, I thought I had a challenge schedule, he was just in China, he's going to India, he was in Le Lawrence Livermore, uh, and he's here. Uh, so it gives you an example he, of how... He, he follows the carbon. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it gives you a sense of how every one of these folks remain committed uh, to our country and to the possibilities of the future, and I, I thank you on behalf of Yale University and this initiative for coming and sharing and kicking us off to a good start. Thank you very much. Thank you, <laughs>